Do you need more ado? Because we can totally give you more ado. Uh, oh, you're set up. Okay, great. Do doing is done. Let us applaud. Okay. Oh, wow. That works. And it's switched on. Great. Um, yeah, you're going to be on the video. Okay. There we go. Sorry. I'm going to have to name my feet to the floor, I think. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, I'd just like to say the um, my slides, to keep them reasonably clear and concise, I don't have a huge amount of text on them. If that's something that uh, you find challenging, the linked presentation from the event page has full speaker notes with most of the transcript. So... Surgery, spacecraft, bridges, what well, do they all have in common? When we're simulating life-critical situations or scenarios in engineering, we need to uh, understand how or when our tools apply, when they're valid. To do that, we need to know exactly what the underlying theory is, what the models they're using are. Some years ago, an entire oil rig uh, slipped into a Norwegian fjord as a result of such a misunderstanding, so it really is important. Now, a few years ago, I was working in engineering, and there was a particularly uh, common um, proprietary tool that we used, and we found some discrepancies, so we wanted, we called up the helpline and we said, look, can you tell us which of the standard literature models you're using? And they told us it was commercially sensitive private IP. The thing, though, is at that point, if there was an equivalent open alternative that was not vendor locked in and we could see all of its models, that would make, we, we couldn't justify continuing to use the proprietary alternative. And at that point, I realized that for those kind of life critical, industry critical situations and scenarios, actually closed source as an economic model has a fairly finite life. You think of other situations where that kind of accountability and transparency, now you notice I've not mentioned anything about cost at this stage. Accountability and transparency and vendor lock-in really matter. Well, for example, the justice system, hospitals, medical devices, data security, cyber security, public sector. And that's, in some ways that's a very positive thought for the future of free software that it can make that kind of difference and that it would be valued. But that only works if it can stand on its own two feet. Um, well, it's not dependent on proprietary employers putting food on the table. So I decided I needed to put this into practice. If I thought this was the case, I needed to quit my job, go out on my own, set up a company. And it turns out that's quite hard. But I learnt that there are ways of doing this. And I'm going to go through some of that now. In particular, um, we had to think very creatively. And um, I think it's appropriate to uh, say a big thank you to a lot of my colleagues in the Belfast Linux group, um, because despite the fact that this has um, been a lot of work in the business sector, being able to work together with uh, colleagues in different businesses um, has been critical. And I think that's um, a moral from the open source world in general. Now, I don't know if many of you have uh, played or come across uh, tabletop games, role-playing games, things like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. Just, just have a quick... Well, there we go. <laughs> we'll just have a quick show of hands, roughly, to kind of see who's, who at least knows what I'm vaguely talking about. Okay, this is a decent number. So for those who don't, essentially you have maybe like a guild or an adventurer's syndicate that comes together. And um, once a month, this was... When I started out, it was quite stressful. So people... people took kindly to me and pulled me into their games to try and take my mind off it sometimes. And we sat down and every month we played. Some people were wizards, some people were warriors or witches, and we would, put, we would get together. Different people in different months would turn up, but we'd form a little, a little consortium, a little team to take on a quest to find gold or rescue kings and queens or to defeat dangerous monsters. And every, every month it would be different. Now, you probably worked out, I'm, I'm going with an analogy here. I haven't just forgotten what the talk is. Um, you might need to bring me back on track once or twice. But there is actually an analogy here to what we've been doing over the last, uh, last couple of years. 
and I'm going to try and use that to make it a bit more concrete than talking about business development in abstract terms, which is not normally the most exciting of topics. Another thing to make this a bit more concrete, and I want you to kind of think back on this as I go through uh, the talk, a case study. So about a year ago, uh, my micro company set up a consortium bid, and that involved a number of different companies coming together to build a data discovery tool for community journalists. And as part of that bid, we had to uh, come up with our risks and mitigation strategies to document those clearly. We had to put together a credible budget and um, how it was going to be divided up, a serious user research strategy and a justification that we could do that. We had to sit down with our community journalist partners and actually work out and try and understand their field and try and see where the common ground was, what we could, what we could do to genuinely make a difference. And that's all before we... That's all before we can even bill, and it's before we even know whether we've got funding. So keep that one in mind. That's, uh, I think, we, once we got the funding, the next step was to uh, bring in a lawyer to write a proper consortium contract. And then we uh, started a user research group last week uh, with community journalists in Belfast, which was fascinating. And we got some really useful feedback. Am I still on the video? Let's slide this way a bit. And... Beyond that, um, we're building out some proof of concept things. We're doing a feasibility study and development um, around the practicalities, and we'll build a prototype over the next six months, at which point we'll see how we can take it to the next version, V1. Okay, so I'm going to go through that, through the concepts behind that now. You probably heard me say the words consortium and syndicate a number of times there. Our structure is a little bit, as I say, creative. We have a syndicate. Um, that's a business syndicate, not a crime syndicate. Although if we get more desperate, it might move that direction. In our business syndicate, we've got a number of different companies, mostly ranging from about one up to six people or so. And those companies can work together in different projects. They do, some of them do most of the work in the syndicate. Some of them do most of their work outside the syndicate. Each individual project uh, has a project consortium. And on the far left, um, for those looking at me, no, wait, right, that's right, someone can correct me. Um, the, we can see two companies, there's Glaze there, a UX company, uh, they're serving a client as part, as part of a syndicate service, serving a client on one project consortium. On the left hand side, we've got another project consortium with my company, Flex and Teal, and a couple others, external company, serving a different client. And in the middle, we've got three companies together formed a project consortium to try and do a particular phase of product building. And those, all, those can be overlapping in parallel at different times. 90% of our structure is in the project consortium, those groups. Now, back to the story. So... Not long after setting up my own, I realized that when you're running a company, you need to have a focus. And that could be a particular community that you want to serve. It could be a particular uh, product that you're passionate about or gap in the market. And for me, that was, that was open source. Um, what you find is if you've got two, at some point they're going to end up conflicting. And often you'll end up having to compromise two things you didn't want to before having to make a decision. So knowing up front what your focal point is makes a big difference. So I said, well, I want to do open source. And it turns out that's two things, open and source. Now, I was quite clear when I set out that that was my focus, not a particular product or project. So I said, to give myself the best chance of sustainability, I'm not going to pick, I'm not going to say I work on this tech stack or even this sector or even these, these tools. I'll go where I'm needed and do what needs to be done. Um, not quite that mercenary, but you know what I mean. So uh, when we looked at this, we thought, who, who cares about transparency and accountability? Who values it? Who puts an actual value on it? And that's sometimes private sector. And that's some, a lot of the time, that's public sector and third sector. And we realized that they don't see open source as 
as a unit in itself. They see it as a strand and a rope. And we began to realize that source kind of means you're thinking about a, a dev house in some sense, normally. Um, and open means so much more than that. One extremely rewarding side effect of uh, the last few years is becoming um, involved in the open access communities, the open data community. Uh, open access, for those who aren't aware, is the share, public sharing of research and research findings. And open data is the public sharing, often of government, but also private sector data, publicly. And they have their own communities and drives behind them. I also mentioned those are the, kind, the people who value open source that actually want to give you work are people who care about open standards, open APIs, open innovation, having insight into the process, transparency and cybersecurity. And so that kind of made us expand our thinking in a number of different directions. It's a generalization of that. Um, some of you might be aware of the term USP, unique selling point. And that and a lot of other business terms you start to use fluently after a while. So business and innovation has its own, uh, its own technical language. And we realized that actually, if we're going to give ourselves the best chance of success, because there's very little point in me standing here today and saying, I started an open source company to show that this was sustainable. And last year I quit and went back to working for my previous proprietary employer. However, if I can say, what does open give me? If I say I'm going to in some ways limit myself by uh, focusing on clients who value openness, who are willing to agree for us, to us upstreaming by default any improvements we make, every limitation should be an extension in another direction. What does that allow us to do? How does that free us up? Um, I kind of feel this is a bit of a gross misrepresentation of what product building looks like. Um, if anyone knows how to how to relate um, building a product to getting a large uh, box of money, please, please contact me afterwards. But um, in this case, we've got, a, we've got a project consortium. Our adventurers, four adventurers, have come together. And they've gone through the quests, through the dark dungeons. They've fought the monsters. And they've finally come to their goal. And um, this is their apparently very successful web platform. Now, we realized that when we're building products, um, some of the work that we do is, is internal, is R&D. And uh, what our proprietary competitors can't really do straightforwardly is work in different groups and share IP between them without a huge amount of complication. That's a competitive advantage for the fact that in our consortia, all of our shared IP, anything that's not agreed specifically to go to a client, is open. So this then meant take a few different um, products that we've worked on and that we do have control over. They're fully open source. Um, I've mentioned data times already. The one at the bottom is a natural disaster simulation tool for places natural disasters don't happen. So you can simulate lava flows in Northern Ireland. Bet you didn't know that was a niche market. Um, in the middle <coughs> is one called Project Lintel, which helps open data publishers uh, get their data uh, shared and validated before it's released. And all of these are web platforms with a very <laughs> similar stack. For those of you who are familiar with it, Kubernetes, Laravel, and Vue.js, kind of the core. And because we are uh, working in a way, even though those consortia that are working on those are overlapping but distinct, we don't have a problem about actually building up the IP across them. That's something that proprietary vendors just, that's a much harder concept, let's say. And you'll see that we have into this, this kind of common uh, benefit of IP coming in from the other side there, in that big arrow, we slide over to client services. And here you can see a poor defenseless dragon um, that's been attacked by an even king and had all of its gold stolen. And uh, our intrepid adventurers down at the bottom there have formed a project consortium to uh, help the dragon uh, regain control of its uh, stable kingdom with balanced taxation. Now, for us, if we're talking about doing open, um, one of the ways that we can do that with clients is uh, look at what they really want in terms of their IP. 
is what they want uh, their IP to be closed, or is it to have something that they can commercialise in their own way? And again, we need, we've had to be quite pragmatic with that and say, okay, well, if, you're, if you want to keep this private, we'll be happy to agree with you. However, here are things that we've improved in open source projects. We should be able to upstream those automatically, and that should be in our contract. We want to be able to say, here are the things, and this is a very useful phrase for non-technical clients, non-sector specific. Things that are non-sector specific, we want to be able to start uh, open source projects or feed into open source projects. Because actually non-technical clients, often what they want to make sure is that they're not going to end up with another competitor who sees the source online. They don't really have an issue with a JavaScript calendar when they are an engineering company. So it's trying to understand that. And we'll actually find it's much easier to talk about ideas of reciprocation with non-technical clients than it is with technical clients who have a very fixed idea of how the industry should work. And I don't think, to my memory, that we've actually ended up having this as a permanent stumbling block with a non-technical client. So a few more kind of practical points. Um, first of all... <laughs> Here you can see a group of adventurers uh, hunting a yeti, a giant snow monster. Um, and this kind of reckless behaviour is why you very rarely see them in the wild these days. Uh, you'll see here that we've got different people doing different jobs. We've got somebody trying to heal and trying to protect. We've got somebody taking the hits at the bottom from the, from the giant monster. We've got a magician doing, uh, doing something over on the right hand side, or left hand side. And we've got somebody uh, up on the top and she's taking chunks out of its, out of its head, apparently. Those skills, um, you have to be aware in advance that if you go out with a small number of skills, there's a lot of things you're going to have to try and work out very fast. Having a diversity of skill sets, recognising the value of things that you don't know and have never even considered is critical. Just a few examples. So... Infrastructure, data, systems administration, DevOps and cybersecurity. Uh, product, user experience, user interaction, SEO, uh, communications, copywriting, social media, tender writing, uh, business development, uh, finance, marketing, uh, oh, development, uh, front end, back end, app dev, systems, hardware, design, audiovisual, um, and then training, research. Uh, funding, um, applications, and administration, of course. And that's just what your average client will expect from a lone freelancer. So, if you're building a group, you need, to have, you need to have those covered off. You don't need to be brilliant at all of them, but you need to be able to, uh, to, be able to treat them convincingly and actually get in the people who can support you. Conversely, you need an overlap of skill sets. So, when you are uh, out in a consortium, and this is particularly important in our kind of, uh, our kind of syndicate structure where we have a loose, po uh, loose group and uh, individual projects are very tight-knit. If something goes wrong with the company, it goes under or somebody, um, a critical person is ill, there still needs to be an overlap. There needs to be built-in redundancy. And even more than that, if you are uh, having to pull from a pool, and one particular skill is scarce, then you could end up paying considerably more than market value or market rate for a particular skill. And that's not sustainable either. So having overlap of skill sets means uh, healthy checks and balances. I'm not going to spend too much on the what this isn't, um, but just because these are common questions that we get. At the end, there'll be a link to uh, some slides and uh, a repository where... We have a, a nice poster trying to highlight some of the differences between different models to, to make it a bit clearer. What you mean? So, is what we're doing, is it a startup or a cooperative? One of those? You mean? Now, um, cooperatives work in lots of different ways. However, most cases they tend to be incorporated. Our syndicate, that's the, the big group, our syndicate is not incorporated. Our project consortia, in fact, in some cases are. Um, the uh, other difference is that the first focus for all of our member companies is on their company. So everybody, uh, so we're not asking anyone to say, now I focus on the syndicate rather than your company. That's part of what you're doing. Uh, it might be most of what you're doing, but it's still 
about a balance. Is it freelancing or a contractor group? Well, again, there's lots of shades of grey areas and different ways these work. But generally, in these cases, you'll find that the client is ultimately in control over how the group interacts on their project. Um, and one of the reasons that we uh, don't have that is that it involves, avoids that kind of power imbalance. So we generally only take on projects where, which are deliverable-based. That's very hard to say, deliverable-based. And, the, and that they have a uh, requirements gathering within the group. That also means that you need to have people who can do business analysis. So <clears throat> it keeps that an equitable relationship, um, both for the members of the group, but also for the client. Some of you might be familiar with an agency model. And that's where... Uh, Normally, largely non-technical company will uh, be working directly with clients and then will subcontract out work to individual um, subcontractors, often technical subcontractors. That's got downsides for both um, parties that we try and avoid. Uh, an agent, from the agency's perspective, it's trying to sell on services that it's quite dependent on people who aren't necessarily bought into them they can't deliver if their subcontractors go missing. And that actually happens with surprising frequency. Um, so they, it can be extremely stressful as an agency project manager. And also, you have to have enough of a markup on people's day rates to be able to cover that risk. On the flip side, for subcontractors, they're seeing this markup and thinking, why am I being paid this when the client's being charged this? Um, that's something that only becomes apparent when you start running projects. But... Um, it also means that subcontractors often don't feel bought in and you have an incentive structure where the agency is entirely dependent on the client, not on the subcon individual subcontractors, which can lead to quite a significant power imbalance. All their incentives are to serve the client it's ahead of the subcontractor. Okay, so the summary takeaway here is the way this model works is because we can have shared IP is open and that solves a number of complications to facilitate that model. So if it's optional, it's a bit different to what we're doing in structure. Right, so that's all very theoretical. Um, how do you start out? So say you've kind of been sitting here thinking, uh, you know, either I'm going to go and do role-playing games or I'm going to start a consortium and I haven't worked out which. Um, if you decide to start a consortium, a few things to think about. First off, that one area you might want to start looking at initially is R&D um, and R&D services, um, particularly because it tends to value highly specialist skills. And often, um, if you're wanting to go out on your own, you have, there are certain skills that you can provide, um, particularly if you're technical. It's one way that you can start working with a couple of non-technical and a couple of technical people. Um, it's... In this case, we've got, as you can see here, a, a, consor a little project consortium out to, uh, about to start a quest. And they've got their map, shows their way to a misty forest, and they don't know what's in the forest. But from their experience and from their background knowledge, they can make a fair guess. And that's a little bit like R&D, that there is, it's a bit more forgiving than having to offer five nines uptime on cloud services. Um, but it really appreciates when you have a lot of background skills and experience. So have a look at that as a way of getting started. Um, a couple of steep learning curve skills we've had to get used to. Here we've got a uh, queen who's been served by the project consortium. And um, she's very grateful and she has rewarded them with this magic wand of light. And unfortunately the project consortium has two... Uh, magical members, and so they're going to have to saw it in half and hope they don't end up with two unmagical sticks. And that's actually quite like one of the big challenges for doing consortium work, is trying to work out up front, maybe on a big project, you will have a whole series of cost centers or work packages, different budgets that you have to pull from in different ways, and you'll also have a set of companies that will be using different budgets out of that collection in different ways, and you have to do all the maths of that. And in short, that means a lot of uh, LibreOffice spreadsheets and Python scripts. 
Um, we've been gradually trying to evolve a bit more systematic tooling around that. Um, and that's something at the end, I've got a link to a repository. Um, we're considering building up some documentation around that. If that's something you'd be interested in, please make sure you plus one the feature request for budget pivoting. Um, that would be helpful for us to know. Uh, but essentially working out how to divide up money in advance. Another um, aspect is business development and tendering. And we can see uh, a lot of the challenges around going out on your own or around understanding how it works. Getting out to, um, to business development events. Some of you might find it's a bit challenging to get to kind of cope with some of uh, the innovation jargon and language and buzzwords. But actually, it's another language. Think of it as another technical language that you go out to these events and you meet people and see them as equals, work with them as equals, and they'll have huge respect for you as well. And that actually pays off in both directions. So valuing um, innovation um, and business uh, digital sector is very important. Um, it's also hard to do things like tendering. You might want to pay someone to come in and help you, um, which we did at one point. But also, it's very easy. So every company involved should be doing it, even single-person companies. Go on to websites. Lots of, web lots of countries will have websites that list all of their available funding. And resourcing. So within resourcing, you have uh, a number of challenges to get people in. Often non-technical skills, um, there will be s small companies nearby that can provide those. But you should, have, um, should be working in with the local community. Um, can I just check time, please? You've got five minutes left. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, in our case, we have done a lot of work with the Belfast Linux group, trying to make events uh, varied. We always have interesting uh, food and activities, I hope. Uh, Feedback is very positive. We even did, uh, have a look on GitHub, we have an adventure pack for going to Belfast Zoo and finding um, for kids to learn about how open source projects work through their mascots. Um, just to warn some Mozillans who mightn't be watching Belfast New uh, Zoo's Twitter feed, uh, we had an unexpected Firefox release last week, um, but it was found in a car park the next day, so it's okay. I also do a shout out to Farset Labs, the hackerspace. Again, trying to link business and technical communities is hugely important. So if you do have a local hackerspace, do, do try and involve them. Okay. Legal, particularly critical for uh, trying to have that structure. If you don't have it at a syndicate level, you need it at a consortium level. So be, be structured. And also recognize that different projects will get in payment at different rates. So uh, you need small projects. Uh, on the way to getting large projects um, that will pay once a year. And <clears throat> final lesson that I want to share is that there's a um, huge risk for new freelancers in drifting into, the, uh, into helping people getting, say, a cat out of a tree when they're being pursued by a legion of the undead. Be very careful when you're on a major project that people are depending on you about taking on too much extra work. Okay, so key summary points. Contract equation. When you're leading a project, you realize risk is an actual measurable quantity. Um, if someone is doing deliverable-based work for you, that's, uh, you should pay them more than if they're doing time-based work. Those add together. If you're joining a consortium, you shouldn't expect to be guaranteed work. You may have to go out and find it, and that means that you can coordinate it yourself. You should also uh, expect that most of your structures around projects, they need to be very tightly structured. And that gives rise to uh, the <laughs> learning experiences, I think is the correct term. That being fair and consistent makes a huge difference when there's not a huge amount of structure. You need to involve people who are good negotiators, who are good at being able to keep everyone on board, because that's um, a lot harder with loose structures and make sure that you're not depending on people or expecting your collaborators to be depending on people who um, have priorities that conflict. Co <coughs> Counterintuitively, um, 
clients who charge less often have more unrealistic expectations. That's one reason to keep a spread of income at different levels.